Hi everyone. If you're new to the channel, welcome to Money Time Coaching. My name is Robert and I'm a mortgage agent level two. I'm also an accredited financial counselor with a specialization in financial coaching. I recently saw this in the news. These three people were arrested for title fraud. Since homeownership or paying off a mortgage is a common financial goal for most people, this video will help highlight the top three aspects of mortgage fraud fraud warning signs, and strategies for fraud protection to help you not lose your home to fraudsters. For more insight on mortgage fraud, make sure you subscribe to this channel and don't forget to hit that like button. Number one, fraud for criminal activities. Straw borrowers is when someone is paid to put their name on a mortgage application on behalf of another person. So their identity is used to obtain mortgage financing. Or a straw borrower could be a victim of identity theft. Money laundering, on the other hand, is when you pay for a home for less than market value and pay the difference in cash. When the purchaser sells the property for the actual market value amount, including the difference they paid the initial seller in cash, then the money becomes successfully laundered. Number two, fraud for profit. This is where you would obtain a mortgage without the intent to repay the loan. Air loans are when mortgages are provided on a property that does not exist. The lawyer, the salesperson, uh, vendor and purchaser have to be in on this in order for it to work. The reason why these professionals would have to be involved in this type of fraud is because it's targeted to, uh, towards unsuspecting lenders. This means that everyone involved in the fraud has to be on the same page in order for the um, fraud to appear real. And then once the loan transaction is completed, everyone involved gets a cut of the money. Value fraud is when dishonest appraisers have the property appraised at a higher value than it's worth. The lender then takes the property that must be sold at a lower rate. Fraudsters will impersonate a person with good credit to use the AVM, and an AVM is a software-based tool used in residential and commercial real estate to determine property value. Then they give the details consistent with the neighborhoods. Uh, this allows them to get a mortgage for more than the property is worth, which allows them to pay the vendor and then walk away with the profit. So for this fraud, the purchaser and the vendor must be in cahoots. Um, they can also use comparables from a neighborhood where values are higher. Title fraud is fraudulent transfer of title of property. The seller is not on title and homeowners of rental properties and properties with no existing mortgages are at the most risk for this type of fraud. 50% of Canadians who own property are mortgage free. So this puts a lot of people at potential risk. Once the fraudsters take title, they can then sell the property or get mortgage financing. One thing I always tell clients is that when you get a home, the goal should always be to be mortgage freer sooner. And once your mortgage is paid off, you should not have to worry about being victims of fraud. That is why I think it's critical for potentially uh, new homeowners and existing homeowners to get title insurance as soon as possible. Title insurance is critical to get because it protects you financially in situations where you were defrauded through title insurance. Foreclosure fraud. In this type of fraud, the homeowner is offered money to pay off their debt as well as any uh, mortgage arrears. What then happens is the person who offered them the money takes title and allows them to live in the property while they continue to make their debt payments. What then happens is the person keeps the money for themselves and then sells the property without the homeowner actually being aware of this. Impersonation. This can happen to lawyers, borrowers, vendors, purchasers, and homeowners, right? They can all be potentially impersonated. But in my opinion, when homeowners are impersonated, the consequences are by far the worst. For example, let's say a homeowner had to leave the country for work and decided to rent their home out during this time. And unfortunately had their home sold because the renters impersonated them. In this instance, the actual homeowners could lose millions of dollars and it could take the courts over a year to sort out. Elderly financial fraud is when a family member, trustee, or power of attorney um, takes advantage of the senior. The power of attorney fraud is generally regarded as elderly abuse. Other than a person in a position of trust committing financial fraud, the elderly have to be careful of online scams, especially if they live alone, 
because they are being targeted and it's not right. For example, from 2019 to 2021, reported losses from elderly abuse in the US reached almost $1.7 billion. The total amount for real estate fraud targeted at the elderly was slightly over $102 million. Now, to be fair, I could only mention the reported numbers. A lot of people who are victims of fraud don't report it right out of embarrassment. So these numbers could be significantly higher. So as a best practice, if you are an elderly person living alone, you need someone that you can trust who will look out for your best financial interests. And if you don't have someone that you can trust, then visit moneytimecoaching.com and schedule a one-on-one -on -one financial coaching session. So that way you can learn about strategies and steps that will allow you to be able to not be victim of fraud. Power of attorney is when a person, the grantor, gives someone else the power of attorney to make decisions on their behalf if they are too ill to make it themselves. There are different types of power of, uh, of attorney, um, such as power of attorney uh, for property as well as personal care. And some ways that you can be taken advantage here is that the person with power of attorney can empty a guarantor's bank account, steal the grantor's checks, make speculative uh, investments, uh, which is careless. And they can also sell the home without the grantor's consent. Number three, fraud for shelter. In this type of fraud, purchasers inflate the income that they earn in order to obtain mortgage financing. This can happen under stated income. And this is because people can artificially inflate the amount of income that they earn to obtain approval. The problem with this is that since the borrower never had the required income to begin with, there is a higher likelihood of default. And this affects the lender, the mortgage industry, as well as the borrowers themselves. People misrepresent liabilities and income. Sometimes people can get frustrated about the mortgage process because the process does involve a lot of document collection. But this is done because if we don't follow the mortgage brokerages, lenders and administrators act, then FISRA, which is um, the Financial Service Regulatory Authority, can fine us up to $10,000 that must be paid within 30 days. So steps have to be followed when we collect the documents and also when we analyze the documents as well. If a mortgage agent is found guilty of committing fraud, they can be charged 100,000 and imprisoned for one year. This is why it's vital to understand the warning signs of fraud, but most importantly, how to prevent fraud from happening. Fraud warning signs. This is not mentioned enough, but several hundreds of millions of dollars is lost annually to fraud. And on top of that, 80% of fraud is committed by or involves industry participants. So this is why as mortgage agents, we must be thorough when we analyze documents and always request supporting documents when necessary. I will highlight some fraud warning signs and how they can be better managed to limit fraud in the mortgage industry. Mortgage fraud based on the property happens when it's being valued by a risk management tool or AVM. So the best way to prevent this would be to ensure that the property does actually exist and that it conforms to the neighborhood by viewing the property. And if going there is not possible, use Google Earth to verify that the property does exist. If you happen to be a mortgage agent watching this video, you're probably thinking that it's not the role of the mortgage agent to protect against the risk of property fraud. It's the lender's responsibility. And to this, I agree with you. But in the real estate industry, it's all about relationships. So when you're able to protect the lender's interest whenever possible, it will only help to build your reputation as a professional. Identity. When it comes to buying property, people largely understand that they will need to provide some documents. But if you run into a person that does not provide their photo identification, do not proceed with an application for them because you're just wasting your time. Also, if there is a power of attorney being used on behalf of a senior, then check the ID verification. Employment and income verification. When analyzing a job letter, always look for inconsistencies or errors. Another thing you want to make common practice is what I call reasonableness tests, which means always look to determine whether or not the income appears to be out of line with the type of employment, applicant, education, or lifestyle. If there are any areas of doubt, always get the necessary supporting documents. Title insurance fraud warning signs look out to ensure that the seller is on title. The seller owned the property for a short period of time. The buyer has pre-existing financial interest in the property. The date and number of existing encumbrances don't make sense. 
The chain of title includes interested parties like a realtor or an appraiser. The buyer and seller have similar names. Um, also pay attention to these warning signs because they can significantly reduce the risk of title fraud. Assets. Sometimes an applicant will state that they have significant income, but little or no assets. Some things to look for here is if the down payment came from a source other than deposits and if the applicant's salary supports savings on deposit. Look to make sure that bank ownership does not include unknown parties and that all deposited funds have a plausible paper trail or explanation. Another sign is when a bank statements don't reflect deposits consistent with income. Again, I would reiterate the um, technique I stated earlier about the reasonableness test. Assets should not appear to be out of line with the type of employment. Also, the applicant age, education, and or lifestyle. If it is, then make sure you get the necessary supporting documents. Purchase and sale agreement. Here are some potential fraud signs to look out for. Non-arms length transactions, where the seller is a real estate broker, relative, or employer. If the seller is not reflected on the title, if the purchaser is not the applicant, or if the purchaser or purchasers are deleted from slash added to the sales contract. If there is no real estate agent involved, if the purchaser is not the applicant, if the power of attorney is used, if the real estate commission is excessive. These are all signs um, of potential mortgage fraud. Credit report. When it comes to the credit report, the liability should be on the credit report should also be reflected on the mortgage application. Also, you need to make sure that the established line of credit is consistent with the applicant's age. Also, when it comes to income and lifestyle, credit patterns should be consistent with that. If all trade lines are open at the same time, if there is recent numerous inquiries and employment discrepancies, then you have to figure out why. Also, look to see if there are big differences between original and new credit reports. If there is, you need to figure out why. Appraisal. Make sure the appraisal reflects the transaction type. For example, if the appraisal is for a refinance, but other documentation reflects a purchase, this needs to be corrected. If the purchase price is a lot higher than the predominant market value, or if it's substantially lower than the predominant market value, figure out why. Large positive adjustments made to comparable properties needs to be justified. So pay attention to the details. Look to see if the comparable sales are actually similar in style, size, and amenities. If uh, a for rent sign appears in any of the photos, also find out why. The address in the photos should match the property address. The appraisal should also not be dated before the sales contract. If significant appreciation happened in a short period of time, look into why. Owner occupancy fraud is a form of mortgage fraud that occurs when the borrower lies and says that the property will be owner occupied. The reason why this fraud happens and is relatively common is because lenders offer lower rates on owner occupied properties. This fraud happens on two types of transactions, purchases and refinance. For purchase transactions, new homeowners insurance should not be for a rental policy. Occupancy affidavits will reflect whether the applicant intends to occupy. Also, sales contracts should not be subject to an existing lease. When it comes to refinance transactions, there should not be a different mailing address on the applicant's bank statement or pay stubs. If there is, again, you need to find out why. The address should also not be different on the credit report. Appraisals should not reflect a vacant or tenant occupancy. Again, here, uh, you want to read the occupancy affidavits because it will definitely reflect whether the applicant intends to occupy. Fraud prevention. One way to help you not lose your home to fraudsters is by getting title insurance. Title insurance will protect you from real estate fraud. It has a one-time payment that lasts as long as you own the property, which is a good thing compared to home insurance, which you have to renew on a yearly basis. What does title insurance cover? It covers against forgery, fraud, typos, and minor errors in the legal description of the property, unpaid utilities, mortgages, taxes, or condo maintenance fees, removing existing structures if they violate zoning laws as well, another person claiming an interest in the property, legal claims by someone else on the property, such as property liens or 
construction liens from unpaid contractor bills. The gap between finalizing property purchase and when it's officially registered to the government as well. I also want to say that the one-time fee is generally much more affordable than the cost associated with fixing title issues that can affect your ability to mortgage, sell, or lease your property. I will include in the description box links on where you can buy title insurance if you don't already have it. In addition to title insurance, you can also protect yourself from mortgage fraud by keeping your mortgage information in a safe spot. So speak with a lawyer as well before giving someone else the right to your home. Research any company or individual who tries to offer you a loan. Shred old documents rather than throwing them in the trash. Contact your mortgage lender first if you have trouble making your mortgage payments. Do a land title search with your provincial or territorial land registry office. This will show the name of the property owner and any mortgage or liens registered on title. The reason I put this video together was because usually when mortgage fraud is committed, it can harm victims, affect the reputation of the mortgage agent, and have an economic impact in the form of higher property taxes due to value fraud, and even affect public health due to drug houses posing a health hazard. But in addition to this, we all strive to own property, and for the most part, it's the biggest purchase that you'll ever have to make. So I wanted to provide you with insight on the common aspects of mortgage fraud, but most importantly, with the best strategies to protect your home from fraudsters. If you found this video helpful and you would like to support the channel, don't forget to hit that like button and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of this helpful content going forward. Also, going forward, I will be including a viewer of the week in all my videos. So if you would like to be featured as a viewer of the week in my next video, make sure you leave a valuable comment on this video in the comment section below about how my content has helped you become more aware of mortgage fraud. You know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and become an official member of Money Time Coaching. Your wallet and your future self will thank you.